Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 7, and this is Session 11. Now, I need, as I do every time, I want to back us up just for a moment and just review the major points of what we were covering when we left off the last time. And what we were looking at, and I've redone the timeline, expanded a little bit, hoping to not just clean it up, but leave some room for some things that we're actually going to add on there today. So I hope you brought your timelines with you again. There's a couple of things we'll, we'll stick on there as we go through the next couple of sessions here today. But we were looking at the pre-flood world, and, um, and, and remember we, we titled that the old world. That's, that was from something we saw that Peter wrote over in 2 Peter. And... Um, we saw that the world, because of its ungodliness, was brought to destruction uh, because of the evil that was in that world and because of the ungodliness of that world. Satan's policy of evil was very successful in bringing the world to that place of destruction. And that's what the adversary wanted. And we turn to this scripture there toward the end of Jude verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And when we were reading through this, Jude was talking about just seven generations from Adam. Enoch was already giving that prophecy about the destruction of what the prophets later were to label the Lord's Day of Wrath. That period of time that we often refer to as the Tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. And when verse 15, I'm sorry, yes, verse 15 talks about these all that are ungodly and their ungodly deeds which they ungodly committed and those ungodly sinners, when he's talking about that, it's important for you to know he's not just describing the fact that men are born with a sin nature or that they commit sin. It's more than that. And really today, we're going to get an understanding of some things. I'll wrap that up for you in just a moment. But... What you're looking at here is an escalation of all of those things, a, a worsening of that. These are, these are people that God is going to bring a severe judgment upon because of their attitude toward ungodliness. They revel in it. In fact, they take pride in it. They're glad to be ungodly, and they're actually working at increasing that ungodliness. That's the thing that's in their mind. That, that's the thing that's... Uh, and, and as I put in your notes there, you could say that they were drunken with ungodliness. They, they wanted that behavior. They exalted in that behavior. And everything they did was to promote and advance and increase ungodliness in the world. Now I want to make a statement right here. We have an idea right now of what that might look like. But your heavenly Father has an idea of what that looks like. And that's the thing we need to get educated in. Because that's going to do something for us. And so just to take you back to one of those last verses let me give you the picture of the pre-flood world wrapped up in Genesis 6-5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now look, I'm just going to give you a foretaste of what's about to come later in the sessions today. Notice what it says here. The wickedness of man was great in the earth. That term is supposed to mean something to us. We are going to define that a little later on and talk about that, but we're not going to do it until we get over to Isaiah 13. I just want to call it to your attention because you'll need to reference this back. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, and now notice these words, the word every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now think about those three words. Every, only, and continually. That gives you a very graphic picture about how God viewed the pre-flood world. When every imagination, and that's why I was saying a while ago, I wasn't stretching the truth when I said everything they were doing was for the advancement and the increase of ungodliness. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, and it was only evil continually. So all of those things, I just want us to take a moment and really look at the, the words that are being used here because they paint a very dire picture of the condition of the pre-flood world. And I'm going to use this phrase again later, but it's important for all of us to understand that when God's looking at this, at when He's going to destroy the world of the ungodly, and from Genesis 6 to 9, we get a picture of the pre-flood world. What's important for us to understand is that God is looking at the world rising to a pinnacle of ungodliness in which He can't stand to look at that any longer. And it has forced him to bring destruction upon the world. But that thing that we just read a moment ago where Enoch prophesied, that wasn't that destruction. The, the flood was like part A of that destruction. The day of wrath that will come out in the future is the one Enoch was prophesying of all the way back there that it was going to come to that place. But when the world came to that place originally, it did that within ten generations. And remember, we put those generations on the board last time. In ten generations, or in your Bible, from Genesis 3 to Genesis 6, you went from Adam in the garden to God destroying the world. That's not a very... That's not a very big span when you're looking at it from the standpoint of the generations. And so God did some things. And what He did was, He slowed down the ability of Satan's policy of evil to rapidly bring the world to a place of that kind of ungodliness. So on your timeline, we wrote this in. And this is probably the last thing you wrote in on your timeline that from over here in Genesis 18, remember in Sodom and Gomorrah, God gave an ensample of the destruction that was yet promised because after the flood, God didn't want anybody thinking, oh, you know what, we can go back to being ungodly again and it won't matter. The flood's come and gone and God's not going to do that anymore. He's not going to flood the, the earth anymore. So what He does is He destroys Sodom and Gomorrah as an ensample that if you're going to live ungodly after the flood, you're going to suffer judgment for that too. And so there is that warning. And then all the way through, all the way through to what we marked early on, that when God interrupted that program with Israel, that both the nation of Israel, and you probably have this on your timeline, and the world at large had both come to a a zenith of ungodliness again. They were back to that place. And so, Jesus, Stephen sees the Son standing at the right hand of the Father, but instead of ushering in His day of wrath, He not only returns secretly and intercepts Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road, but He returns and He sits back down Paul talks him about him presently being seated still at the right hand of the Father. He sits back down until the Father says, it's time to make your enemies your footstool. And so what God did is He, is he saw all of this. He saw 
the development again after the flood Satan begins again to develop the world of the ungodly. And even though Noah and his sons and their wives, they get off the boat and then they, they begin to multiply on the face of the earth, Satan begins to multiply ungodliness on the face of the earth again. And so even though God did some things, it did not stop the world from becoming ungodly, but it slowed that process down. And now, that thing has been built, I say now, back then that thing started building and building and building and building until after that extension of mercy, I mean we're talking about after the cross and after that extension of mercy, when Stephen is being stoned, God could look at both the nation of Israel and the world at large and realize this world has once again become. Remember this world of the ungodly? That wasn't just a nice descriptive phrase. It is really what the world had become. It had become the world of the ungodly. And that's what it had become again by the time that we get here. And when you get to Romans chapter 13, verse 12, that opening phrase, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, is pointing us to the fact that the night is far spent means that this, this period of time in which the, the development of the world of the ungodly has been happening again, that's, that's coming to a close and the day is at hand, and that is the day of the Lord's wrath. And that's why I was telling you, that phrase is not a description of the dispensation of grace. It is a description of when God brought in that dispensation of grace. The night was far spent, and the day was at hand, and that's when God put in this dispensation of grace. And in that dispensation of grace, what does he call that? Much long-suffering. Much long-suffering. So, and by the way, there's a reason. Because if you're understanding this right, you ought to be asking yourself the question. If God got to the place back here where he said, I can't tolerate this any longer the ungodliness and the wickedness and the evil of the world has reached a, a pinnacle, a tipping point that I'm going to have to do something and he destroys it with the flood and then it begins developing that world of the ungodly again so by the time you get to Acts chapter 8 the world has reached that point again you, if, if God is saying to himself I can't stand to view this any longer. I can no longer tolerate this. This has reached a point now where I'm going to have to do something. But instead of bringing in that day of wrath and punishing that, he suspended the program with Israel and he brought in a dispensation of grace, which is the time of God's goodness, long-suffering, and forbearance, right? But wait, here's my question. If, if God's at the place where he says, I just can't tolerate this anymore, then isn't he still tolerating it in the dispensation of grace? He is. He is. That's why it's with much long-suffering. He, he is enduring those vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So wait a minute. How can he say, I just can't, I can't stand this anymore, and now I'm going to continue to stand it. That almost doesn't make sense. And I'm going to answer that for you today because I want you to really understand this from the way, because I have to tell you, this was a bit of an eye-opener for me. That I want you to see this from your father's point of view. And that, I'll say right at the outset, is critical. 
Because this verse, verse 12 in Romans 13, is meant to develop an attitude in you by that first phrase, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. It is supposed to develop the same attitude in us that is in our Heavenly Father. And you're now going to be taught to look at the world at large the way your Heavenly Father looks at it. And yes, we are living in this dispensation of grace. And even though that first phrase is not talking about the dispensation of grace itself, but rather the things leading up to it and the things which will follow it, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, even though that's what he's talking about, there is instruction about how we are supposed to view the world during this dispensation of grace and respond to it. And we will respond to it by casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. But there's something very important for us here, and it's these verses that are meant to develop this attitude within us. Okay, so here's what we know. That when Stephen saw the Lord standing, he did not bring in that day of wrath. But instead, he ushered in this dispensation of grace. Back in time past, God had a program in which he was working with Israel. Satan was doing some things with Israel. But at the same time, Satan had a program working with the Gentiles. And do you know what he was doing with those Gentiles? He was producing the world of the ungodly through them. How does Paul, I don't think I put that verse in there, but how did Paul describe Gentiles, us Gentiles, in time past? Oh, we were superstitious, there's no doubt. We worshipped every god except the true god. But over in, in, in Ephesians, when he says that ye, being Gentiles in the flesh, in time past, we were, and he mentioned several things. We're, we are without hope. We're without God in the world. We were uh, strangers from the covenants of promise. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were on the other side of this wall of separation, which was the law. So God had a program up here with Israel, but Satan had a program down here with Gentiles. And, he's produ and, and yes, he's trying to do some things with Israel, yes, but he's really working with the Gentiles because that, they're on the other side of that wall. God's not working with them. They're great instruments. They're great tools for him to use. And what he's going to do is he's going to use them to develop the world of the ungodly again. And once he does, what then will he do with Israel? He is going to use these Gentiles, develop them into being the world of the ungodly, so that they can do what? What? Eliminate. Israel, exactly. This is going to be his tool to do that. And as a matter of fact, that's his stated purpose. Let me show it to you in Psalm 83. Uh, we, we just did that one. Psalm 83. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have said, come and let us, and here's what it is, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And that's what Satan is doing with the development of the Gentiles into producing a world of the ungodly. And that thing became so successful that even part of the nation of Israel got affected by that ungodliness and took on ungodliness themselves. The real purpose that Satan has is to wipe that out. Now, Psalm 83 has an implication for out here 
in the day of wrath. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, that is going to be what he's going to try to do. But you have to understand that that's not a new thing. This is the thing that ever since God made a covenant with Abraham to make a great nation, from that time forward, he has been producing the world of the ungodly so that he could do away with the nation of Israel. And if he can succeed in doing away with Israel, guess what? He'll hold on to the earth. Because that's the tool God said he would use to repossess the earth. So, <coughs> Satan has a plan for the destruction of Israel. <coughs> Sorry, that was his goal after the flood, and it will be his goal again during the day of wrath. We're going to see that thing show up again. Okay, now I want to take you over to Romans chapter 9 and show you this verse. We, I know we looked at it last time, but now we want to enlarge on our understanding of this because in Romans 9, Paul is talking about that when the world got to this place, it was worthy of judgment. We know it was in the pre-flood world, but now it's going to be worthy again. So take a look with me here. Romans 9, 22. What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? When He says He endured with much long suffering, what's He talking about there? Yeah, he's talking about this dispensation of grace right here. In other words, God was willing to show his wrath and make his power known, but instead, he is now enduring with much long suffering. That kind of gives rise to the question I was asking about earlier. If God had reached the place where he said, I'm going to have to do something about this, why in the world is he waiting another 2,000 years? Oh boy, Karen is really right there. There, I just want you to say it a little different way because there's a, a nuance to that. But because, uh, let me just say it to you like this. If, you, if God has something that He knows has to be done, these vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction, which means they are fit to be destroyed. They're at that place. The only reason that God would put that off is because there is something more important that needs to be done. Have you ever had something that you're going, I'm, that, you know what, I've got to get this done. And then something happens and you go, all right, I've got to take care of this first, but as soon as I take care of this, I'm going to come back and take care of that. That's exactly the kind of principle that's at work here. The reason I'm saying it to you that way is because I don't want you to have the idea that the long-suffering <clears throat> does not mean that God's no longer angry. It doesn't mean He's changed His mind about whether or not they really deserve His wrath. And it doesn't mean that Satan's policy of evil is no longer being effective in the world. So he doesn't have to judge it anymore. God's not looking at this and going, well, I was really angry about it right, now, right here, but now that we're in this dispensation of grace, I've had some time to think about it and I've kind of cooled off and, you know, I'm not so angry anymore. That's not what long-suffering is about. Well, you know what? So when, however, however fit the world was to be destroyed here, by the time the dispensation of grace is over, it will be even more fit. And what we're going to find is that His wrath will burst upon the scene. I mean, when this thing is over, because this is the more important thing that He is doing. And this has to be done. But there's a reason for that. And Karen said part of that reason a while ago. But I want you to, I want you to see more about that. So instead of just giving it to you, we'll, we'll just work our, our way over there. So let me bring you back to Romans 13, 12. And here's the phrase that we're still working on. The night is far spent, 
The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And when we talk about the night, now I don't know how you want to do this on your chart. I'll do it in a different color so it'll be a little easier. But here's what we're talking about. This, this period of time from right here, working all the way over to the place where this is, that is what Paul is referring to as the night. Now, I'm going to give you some scriptures on that because you need more than me just telling you that. But I'm saying, when he's saying, the night is far spent, the night is Satan further developing the world of the ungodly. That's what's going on with that. And God cut that night off at a particular time in order to bring in this dispensation of grace. And the time, you say, well, when did he do that? He did it when the night was far spent. And what that means is, as soon as this dispensation of grace is over, now if something is far spent, what does that mean? What do you take that to mean? Yeah, it's almost over. <clears throat> what he's going to do is, he's going to allow the rest of the night to take place, and then it will be spent, and then he's going to bring in his day. And look, this is, a, this is something we all know about. In the, we say the morning and the evening, but the Bible always says the evening and the morning. That's how it follows. Well, you know what? <clears throat> Satan has been, through his various policies of evil, developing a darkness and a night that will, in, that, that not just will, that has enveloped the world. <clears throat> and then God cuts off that night. He brings in the dispensation of grace. When it's over, the rest of the night will take place. And then God will, with the day... Pierce the darkness of the night. We're going to see this in a little more detail when we look at some verses that are actually talking about this issue. But that's why he says, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. In other words, <clears throat> as far as Israel was concerned, they didn't know about this. Now that it's been interrupted, Paul's telling you where that got interrupted when the night was far spent. Okay, so this phrase that we're looking at here in Romans 13, 12 is made, is intended to make us think about the world at large in a very particular way. And it's the exact way that God the Father and God the Son are looking at the world. And the reason that they're doing that is because this godly thinking that we're going to get in our minds by the first part of this verse, this godly thinking is going to produce a godly conduct and behavior. I know we went through that and you know it's casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. But that, that is doing something though in the eyes of the adversary. That is bringing this issue of when... God brought in this dispensation of grace. I know this won't mean everything to you right now. But it's bringing the issue of when God brought that in in front of the eyes of the adversary and his angelic followers. And that is, that is something that is going to provoke them. <clears throat> you know how when we do the Lord's table... And the Lord's table, there's an element of that that we do that was not part of what Israel did when they celebrated the Passover. There's an element of that that actually celebrates the fact that God had a secret mystery program that He had provided for from the foundation of the world, but He had hid it in Himself. 
and now here we are. And the fact that we're here and we're going to be taking over those heavenly places is <clears throat> once again showing Satan how God caught him in his own craftiness and that provided for those heavenly places to be reconciled back. We're celebrating that with every Lord's table. And you know what that does a little bit? It kind of... Yeah, it does. It irks him. It's, it's kind of like we're... Um, I'm trying to think of another way. Um, it, it, it's kind of like we're, we're, we're kind of poking him with the stick, if, you, if I can say it that way. Like, look what God did. Look what God did. You thought you knew, and look what God did. Well, in the same way that what we're talking about here, there's something about the timing of this dispensation of grace and what God did that is going to be a provocation to the adversary and his angelic followers. <clears throat> and and we're gonna, we're, our behavior is going to produce an action that's going to get a response from them. And they're going to try to put out that light. That We're going to put on that armor of light. And what will happen is we're going to engage the adversary and his angels to our benefit. To our benefit. And I want to say that because... By engaging in this <clears throat> operation of God, we are going to learn some things that we could not learn any other way. And we're going to come to understand some aspects of the power of this curriculum that we could not fully appreciate any other way than by engaging in this conflict with Satan. We're going to gain some skills and we're going to get some experience that we can't get any other way than by doing this. And all of those things that we're doing are propelling us along in our sonship education. And this is really going to be beneficial for us. And so I'm, I'm just taking a moment to talk about that because Knowing, knowing how men is, are, is, how God is dealing with men in the dispensation of grace. How is God dealing with men in the dispensation of grace? Much with much long suffering. Is God punishing people for, right now for the bad that they're doing in the world? He's not. So you know what the tendency of men to think is? And they got away with it. I can do this and there's no consequence to this. And if a man is really not thinking, he'll even get to thinking, there, there's not even a God. There's not anything going on. <clears throat> and so, as they're doing this, Paul writes, or, because that's the thinking, Paul writes early on in the book of Romans to clarify how God views the ungodliness of the world. Because in this dispensation of grace, that's what he's really looking at. And so here's, here's how he does it. Romans chapter 2 and verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you really think you're going to get away with it? You really think? Verse 4, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, here's how God says it, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He says, do you know what's happening? As you're going along in this dispensation of grace, and you're doing what you want to do, and you're participating with the policy of evil that is creating this world of the ungodly, you are provoking the wrath of God. But He's not pouring it out on you now. What's actually happening now is that you are treasuring up unto yourself wrath. It's like it's all being deposited into an account and it's building. And there's going to come a time when that account gets paid out and that's going to be against the 
day of wrath. There's a day when that wrath is going to be poured out on the world. Now look, there's a balance here. I'll say this as we stop for the break. There's, there's, there are two ideas here, and they've changed through history, depending on how the preaching went. There was a time when preachers preached uh, that God was angry with everybody. And then as history went along, then they preached that, that God just loved everybody. Well, let me tell you, there's truth in both of those. And this is what we're about to discover. Because if we start thinking that, <clears throat> first of all, you have to understand that God's dealing with us the way that He is out of His goodness to lead us to repentance. And that is an issue of His love. But if you think that because nothing is happening to you and you're getting away with it, that God's just either not concerned with it or He just loves you too much to do anything about it, or he's afraid somehow to confront the evil of the world, then you don't understand that today, today, and I'm going to show you this in the scripture, in this dispensation of grace, God is long-suffering, but his wrath is still being provoked to the extent that it is being treasured up against the day of wrath. And by the time this dispensation of grace is over, it will be worse than what it would have been if that day had burst on the scene back at the time of Acts 8. God has not had time to mellow out. That's not what the scripture is going to teach us. And that's not what Paul is going to say. He's not looking at it and going, well, it made me kind of angry when I first thought about it, but now I'm not so angry. That's, there are, there's nothing in your Bible to indicate that. that that's what men may want, but that's, there's nothing in the Scripture to indicate that. So what I'm trying to say here, as we get ready to do this, is here's the first testimony of how God views the ungodliness of the world as it is happening in this dispensation of grace. They are treasuring up wrath against, unto themselves against the day of wrath. Now that's the plain statement of it. Why do I tell you that? <clears throat> because your attitude toward the ungodliness of this world has to match your father's. If it doesn't, you will not cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Mine has to match his. I mean, I have... Now, I, I know we can get into all the nuance of this. Right? We hate sin and we love the sinner and you can do all of that. Here... We're losing the picture of what's being talked about here. And that is that the world has already reached the place of being worthy. They are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction here. And now we're going here. And God says, and now, here's the way I'm looking at it. You are now treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. Only if you see this world the ungodliness of this world the way your heavenly Father does. Only if this assembly views the world the way He does are we actually going to be able to respond to this world and the policies of, of evil that Satan has put in place and labor with our Father. That's the only way we'll be able to do that. If we see it any other way, and I'm going to... I'm becoming more and more gripped with this. I'm trying to guard my words here because I'm not trying to just put this all into my words. I'm trying to show you how he described them back here, being vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, how he's viewing it 
in, with much long suffering now, that they're treasuring up wrath, that God, God is looking at what Satan is producing in this world. And it provokes his justice. God has postponed that justice in order to do something that is more important right now. But, that, but, but the, the anger and the outrage of what is going on in the world has not abated in him. He, doesn't, he hasn't gotten used to it or feels better about it. And here's what I'm coming to learn. There are things that happen in this world that I have kind of, you know, let me say this right because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying about myself. But you know, you just kind of get used to things that are happening and you're not, you're not bothered by them the way they used to bother you. You just sort of got used to that's just the way it was. And when it comes to casting off the works of darkness, remember those three sets of two, you know, uh, drunkenness and rioting, and uh, 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 you remember those, those six things that are later on in the verse, and now I'm drawing a blank on them, but th those, those things represent core issues of the ungodliness that has been produced in this world that we're going to have to face immediately. And I, 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 just, I'm just, I know I haven't explained this right. You're a smart group. You may have caught on. I just don't think I've done it right. Do, do, do you, um, Are you saying it should anger us? It should. But it shouldn't anger us because of our flesh. It should anger us because we are viewing what is happening from the standpoint that our Father is viewing it. We're angry for the same reason He's angry. We understand what it's actually doing. It's not just, oh, well, I don't like people to do that. We may not, but there's more to it than that. It ought to. And, and it's, it's, it's th this is one of those places where at this point in the education, we can't... Look, I'm not asking us to be ugly to people. Don't, are you following what I'm saying? I'm not asking you to go around and insult everybody. I'm not asking you to stand in line at Walmart and go, you ungodly sinners that commit those ungodly deeds that you've ungodly committed, hurry up. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to view what Satan has produced in bringing this world to becoming the world of the ungodly. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one way it's hard to get over it. You look around in America today, and you, you go down, when you come in, you know what? You see the parking lots of the churches that have cars in them, and people are coming out, and people talk about the Lord, or someone that you meet at the store says, have a blessed day, and you hear all that, and you go, is the world really that ungodly? And those are the kinds of things that, that, that mask the issue of what Satan really has produced in this world. In other words, we're not seeing it from the viewpoint of our Father. We're just kind of looking at it comparatively. We're looking at it and going, well, I think it could be a lot worse. I got news for you. It's going to get a lot worse. I'll take you to the end. I'm, I'm just struggling to make my point here. At the end, they will deny the Lord that bought them. We read that scripture last week. At the end, men will come in in their perniciousness. They will come into assemblies and they will privately, not publicly in front of everyone, privately behind the scenes begin sowing the seeds of a doctrine that ultimately denies the Lord that bought them. 
and it'll spread like a cancer through the assembly. And at the end, either the assembly has crumbled and gone away, or it has changed its message to the lie. And it's now promoting the lie. And, and, and this, it's so much, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the scripture on it, but when the Lord comes back at his second advent in the great and terrible day of the Lord to have his, his to execute judgment upon his enemies and avenge his cause with Israel, the people of the world, it's not that they don't know who he is. I'm going to show you the verses. They know who he is. They don't want him to come back. They don't want him to take possession of what is rightfully his. They don't want his kingdom set up. I'm going to show you the verses that say this is what they want and this is what they don't want and it's crystal clear. And the world has gotten to that place before. It has gotten to that place again. And all that's happening now in the dispensation of grace is a furtherance of those things. But look, I know you may not believe this, but I just I am convinced. Even people who go to church every single Sunday and sing the songs, when it comes right down to it, they don't want that kind of righteousness to show up. That's not what their heart wants. Their heart wants to do something different. The scary thing, I promise this will be the last thing, and we will take our break. <sighs> when Satan made the boast that men would rather live in his kingdom than in God's, the scary part of that is, for the most part, it's true. People want what they can do in his kingdom. No yeah. You can do what you want. They don't want to they want to justify what God does not justify. That's exactly right. And and that's the difference. And you know what? We all have known these differences within the Christian community. We have known this wrong. We we looked at people who were playing church and people who were serious about serving the Lord. We've always seen these kinds of differences. Now we're coming to a real difference. Your father is going to ask you to start thinking about the world at large. He's not talking about hating your neighbor. What did he just get through instructing you to do? Love your neighbor. But there's a purpose behind that love, right? You're not loving them because they're an ungodly sinner. You're, you're loving them because you want God to do something with them. Yeah, and you are. You are sad about what's going on with them. You are. So God's not asking you to hate your neighbor, but He is asking you to look at what Satan is producing in the world at large and to view that the way he views that. I'm going to tell you now, there are people who name the name of Jesus Christ who would stand up if they heard a sermon like this and they said, you're telling me that God was going to judge the world again back here and the world is as worthy today as it was back then. I don't think God, does, I don't think God can justly judge the world. And they would say that. I don't think God can righteously judge the world. Paul addresses that back in the book of Romans. And he's in the dispensation of grace. Is it any wonder that one day those that name the name of Christ would deny the Lord that bought them? I'm just saying, that what Satan is doing in this world, it's not through yet. Boy, I, you know... Well, it did change, didn't it? Okay, I told you I would quit. I will quit. I'm just trying to make this point. Does everybody kind of get where I'm going with that? I hope. Okay, I don't want to swing the pendulum too far, but I just want to get us 